perfect. And I'll put full screen. There we go. And we're on. Fantastic. Okay. First of all, it was a, such a surprise that you accepted uh, out of the blue. Uh, and so it's really a, a, a very, it's, a, it's an honor. So because uh, so many of us, as you know, um, have been deeply, um, deeply touched and inspired by the work that you have done and the videos that you have online. So well, th thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Are you in Boston right now? Not exactly. I don't live quite in Boston, but near Boston. Yes. Okay. The weather is good. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, um, so let's just dive right in. Um, so today I am contacting you on behalf of uh, Boss School, which is Brussels Outdoor School, which is the first democratic uh, school in the city of Brussels. Uh, it was a forest school for four years and then transitioned uh, into a five-day democratic school on the Sudbury model a year ago. So we're just finishing our first year. And it's been a tumultuous ride and there's many readjustments that are um, needed and we're in a critical phase. And I've been following this school for a while and now I'm getting much more involved. And I would like to do anything that I can to try to see how we can add some resilience uh, to, to a school like this uh, because I've seen a few before that haven't survived past the first year. And so I'd like I'd like maybe your your input um, to see to, to explore a little bit more what are the challenges that schools like this usually face, and what we could do to make sure we reach resilience instead of reaching a breaking point by the end of this year. And so maybe I'll just dive into the first question. Sure. <laughs> um, for, first of all, uh, just to clarify. Um, how drastically different is a democratic school system with any other system um, in terms of, um, of free learning, uh, child-directed learning? Yeah, that's a that's a really good um, good place to start. I I think it's I think that probably most people who hear about a democratic school, especially one on the Sudbury model. Um, don't even when they hear the words they don't really realize how different it is from um from what we usually think of as school um we tend to people tend to to mold what they hear into what makes more sense to them based on their previous experience so people hear the words about a democratic school but they but their brain is telling them, well, this is kind of a, a progressive school where maybe children have more choices, but they're still going to be studying the usual things in one way or another. And they're going to be, they're going to learn the same kind of material that they would in school at roughly the same schedule. No, <laughs> you know, that, that's, uh, that's the mistake that people make. And one of the results of that, of course, is that a lot of people um, because they think, you know, the words all sound good to them in the way they're in their head interpreting the words. Um, they start off with the school not really um, fully recognizing how radically different it is. So here are here are some of the ways that such a school is different. Um, you know, first of all, um, you have to to begin with, you have to reframe your concept of what education is. So we think of, we use the word education as a, as a word referring to something that adults do to children, right? Adults educate children, right? So the adults are the active participants, children, absorb what the adults present to them. That's what we usually think of. And then the adults test the children. That's our usual system of education. Well, in, in a democratic school, adults don't educate children. That's the first thing that's hard for people to get into their heads. 
what adults do in a democratic school is provide the conditions that allow children to educate themselves. And the task of education is the children's own. So that's one huge difference. <laughs> yeah. The second difference has to do with really what we mean by what is it to become educated, right? What is it to become educated? Um, in our traditional schools, it's to learn a certain body of knowledge that somebody has decided, really nobody decided this, it's just been kind of passed along from generation to generation. But some body of knowledge called a curriculum that somehow is deemed to be important to learn. And, um, and there's very little evidence that any of this is important to learn, any more important than all the stuff that's not on that curriculum, right? I mean, there may have been a time in history a long time ago when there was a sort of a finite body of knowledge. I mean, at one time, if you if you understood everything that Aristotle wrote, you knew everything there was to know, right? I mean, <laughs> if you, and so, but that's not true anymore. <laughs> and so, exactly. you know, there's, there's, we, there, there's no end to the fascinating, interesting knowledge that's out there right now. There's no end to the number of different skills that are valuable to our culture today. Nobody can learn more than a tiny, tiny smidgen of all of that, right? Mm -hmm. But we have a system that is predicated on the idea that everybody's supposed to learn the same smidgen. <laughs> everybody's yeah. supposed to learn the same little tiny segment of all the knowledge and skills that are out there and that we can test them on it. And, um, and, and education is learning that stuff, at least learning it long enough so you pass the test, right? <laughs> so the idea in self-directed education in a democratic school, education is not that. Exactly. <laughs> so edu education, it, the way I like to define education, you know, we have this definition on the Alliance for Self-Directed Education yeah. website for people who might be interested. This is an organization yeah. that, um, that I helped to found a number of years ago, um, that education is everything that a person learns that helps that person to live a meaningful and satisfying, and sometimes I add moral life, right? So that's what an education is. Now, what that means is that an education is a different thing for everybody. For, for you to live a satisfying and moral and meaningful life doesn't mean that you're gonna learn exactly the same things that I'm going to learn for my <laughs> meaningful and satisfying life. We have different goals, we have different interests, we have different, you know, different. And so, the, so that there's no way that we could determine whether you are more educated or I am more educated. A test wouldn't do any good because we are on different tracks. <laughs> We're on exactly. different, we have different interests. We have different kinds of skills that are important to us. We have different, you know, and so that, so the idea that you can test for education, the idea that you, that education is going to be the same thing for everybody, that goes by the wayside. <laughs> the, the, sometimes I'm asked, especially by people, uh, at government levels, uh, oftentimes in Europe, who are interested in the question, well, how can we evaluate a democratic school? And, and my response to that is that in my mind, there's two ways to evaluate any school. One is, are the children happy <laughs> at the school? And if they're not happy at the school, that means the school is total failure, right? And the second question is, when, the, when, when they graduate, when they go out into the world, are they doing okay in the world? Are they, you know, are they living a satisfying and meaningful life by their criteria? Are they contributing to the culture more than they're taking from the culture? Are they, if they're, if, if a lot of them end up in prisons or in, you know, then that's probably not a good education system. Or if a lot of them end up having to be supported in one way or another, because they can't make a living, that's, that's probably not a good education system. 
So if it, as long as an education system is producing people who are productive and happy and uh, living a meaningful life and are doing more good for the world than harm to the world, that was a good education system. So you can't evaluate in the short term other than looking at whether people yes. are happy or not. Yes. Generally speaking, happiness in childhood is probably the best predictor of uh, happiness in the future and being a good and <laughs> productive person in the future. So it's not a bad way to assess. So uh, the other thing I can say about, about the, to, that is common to democratic schools, it is very, very different from our usual schools. Our, our, what I would say is the three main characteristics of a democratic school. The first is that there is a democratic process of administration of the school mm -hmm. so that the students, as well as the staff members, have a vote in how the school operates. Um, the rules of the school are made democratically. That's one of the basic principles of democracy, that rules that you have to live by, you should have a voice in making those rules. So in a traditional school, that's simply not true. The rules are handed down authoritatively, hierarchically uh, to the children what they have to do. So that's the first, that's one basic difference. School, typically they have, there's a regular school meeting that all the students and staff members are part of and they, there's generally a fairly formal procedure, although schools differ from one to another in how formal the procedure is, but ultimately there's some kind of a decision being made in which uh, the students as well as the staff members have a voice. Um, at a typical Sudbury school, there's a one person, one vote. So whether you're a four or five year old student or a 70 year old staff member, you have the same vote. That doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that you have the same influence. <laughs> the, the, um, in my observations of school meetings at, sta at Sudbury schools, the staff don't hold back and, and the students often are very keen on listening to the staff because the staff are usually are usually uh, respectable people. They've been around for a while. They may have more knowledge. They articulate better and so on and so forth. So I don't want to pretend that the staff members, that student, that, that the four or five-year-old student has as much influence in the ad. But you know, there's a kind of a myth about what democracy is. Democracy doesn't mean that we all have equal influence. It means that we all have a vote. <laughs> we all are allowed to vote on this and we all have the potential of having influence. Yes. So that's, uh, I think that that's important to clarify that because sometimes yes. people will attend a school meeting at a Sudbury school and they'll say, well, you know, I saw these little kids there and none of them said anything or they didn't get their way. And in the end, there was this vote, but it seemed like the older students and the staff members were dominating. Well, that's that's to be expected. And in some sense, um, what's happening when this is, occurs is the younger children, I think, are observing, they're learning you still have to persuade them because in the end, there's a vote, right? right? And so you have to be articulating in a way that everybody in that school can understand. You're making a new rule. And this rule applies to the four and five-year-olds as well as everybody else. And it's only going to be effective if they understand it. And, and it's going to be most effective if they also agree to it. So mm -hmm. that's at any rate, that's the democratic part of how the school operates. Then the second thing to understand is that the staff members play a very different role from what the role that teachers play in a typical school. This comes from the idea of self-directed education. In most Sudbury model democratic schools, the staff members don't call themselves teachers because they don't believe they do any more teaching than anybody else at the school. We're all, we're all teachers, we're all learners in any conversation and anything going on, we're both teaching and learning at the same time. In real life, we don't distinguish. Sometimes, sometimes there's a role for a teacher. Sometimes, you know, sometimes somebody wants a teacher to teach them how to play the piano better than they can or maybe even to teach them advanced math. Who knows, somebody might be interested in that and wants somebody yep. to teach them that because it's hard to dig it out of the book. But, the, but you, don't, you don't need teachers that 
to anything like the degree that we have in school and you and the teachers are always at, when there when there is teaching at a democratic school it is always at the request of the student yes. it's yes. never imposed exactly. it's never imposed it's never and and you know that and it only lasts as long as the student wants it right so that's the that's the way that works um and very often when you think about teaching as it occurs sort of at least on a short-term basis students are probably on average more likely to go to another student for help or advice or their thoughts or uh, on something than to a staff member and um, partly because there are more students but also partly because sometimes sometimes students sometimes people who are just a little bit beyond you are better teachers to you than people who are maybe too far beyond you and mm -hmm. the other thing sometimes if you ask an adult and this can even occur in a Sudbury model school the adult gives you more than you want <laughs> that's <laughs> and, an interesting point yes yeah. <laughs> and uh, and students usually don't you know, students will just, I want to know how to do this. And the student will teach you how to do this. Uh, an adult might say, okay, not only that, but let me show you this also. <laughs> and, I, and now I'm getting bored. Yes. Know, so I, so yeah. that's, um, that's okay. So that's, so that's the, the so, so the staff have a lot of administrative things to do in the school, the staff, it's important that the staff be around. The staff are available to answer questions, to be helpful, to, um, they play all kinds of roles from sort of informal counseling to students who are looking for that to um, to teaching when students want help in learning something um, and so on and so forth. So that's that's the second difference. And then the third difference is that students are students are not assigned to any spaces or they're not assigned to grades. Uh, there is no segregation of children by age or anything else. So students can move around the school freely all the time. Um, they can, and there's no place where only little kids have to be or only big kids have to be. And a lot of the education at such a school occurs because children are not segregated by age. So younger children are always learning from older children. They're observing what older children do and they want to do that, or they're playing with older children and the older children boost them up in one way or another to a higher level of activity. You know, it's not uncommon for children to learn how to read at such a school because they're playing with a kid who can read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the one who can read is reading the words on the computer game they're playing together and sort of pointing out the words that the younger child is, lo and behold, without even thinking that they're learning how to read, is learning how to read. Um, Sometimes I've observed teenagers love to read to little kids, um, just like adults often like to read to little kids. I think teenagers even more so like to do it. And you'll see little kids sitting on the laps of teenagers being read to, and that's a huge stimulus for learning how to read yourself. They're not doing it to teach how to read. They're doing it just because it's fun to read to little kids and little kids love to be read to. And, so on. It occurs in other realms as well. If you've got a if you've got a campus with trees and some of the kids are climbing trees, the younger kids are, get the idea. Wow, I I would like to try to climb that tree and so on. So that's the um, that's the way learning occurs. And the older kids, of course, by interacting with the younger kids, are in some ways learning even more valuable skills. They're yes. they're learning how to care for somebody else, how to be helpful, how to be, how to be and how they're they're acquiring nurturing abilities they're they're also getting a sense of their own maturity because they are they are even a eight-year-old interacting with a five-year-old is the mature one in in the part in the partnership um, and they are also, the older kids are often being energized and inspired by the activities of the younger ones. So, you know, I, um, I'm, I don't know how it is in Brussels, but here in the United States, um, 
teenagers often feel that they're kind of beyond uh, the kinds of creative fun things that little kids do like making like painting or making things with clay all kinds of artistic kinds of things that we tend to do when we're little and then we sort of grow out of (laughs) and um, but I think partly because there's little kids doing these things older kids continue to do these things sometimes with little kids that's the excuse for doing it maybe but they also enjoy doing it themselves they're more likely to continue playing fantasy games which is something that people tend to grow out of if there's not little kids around inspiring them to do it so I think that the the natural creativity of young children helps to keep the older children in a more creative and energetic kind of mind than they might otherwise be in our culture. So those are so those are some of the differences between. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can you can I'm sure that people listening and hearing this can see how, you know, if you. Uh, that you just can't walk into a school, a democratic school, and expect to see something that looks like your typical picture of school. Exactly. Exactly. It's worlds apart. So thanks so much for clarifying and giving these really rich pointers. It's it's so interesting. Um, You've probably seen this many times um, throughout um, throughout your life, uh, when a Sudbury school establishes itself, and they're, they're, they they have to go through readjustments and readjustments to try to, you know, first of all get um, uh, get into a more uh, rooted and grounded uh, situation, and to also have a stable um, a stable amount or uh, of 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 participants in the school. Um, and uh, this can sometimes be challenging. I'm wondering if you see any patterns uh, with different Sudbury schools that start out that, that we, should, we should be aware of. Yeah, so I, um, I should qualify this by saying I've never been a staff member at a Sudbury school nor sure. a student, although my son was a student many years ago at the original Sudbury Valley School. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the um, but I hear the stories and I know that there are many, many schools that start up and unfortunately quite a number of them don't make it beyond the first year or two. And I think that there's a, I think that there are a lot of, I think that there are a number of um, number of common reasons why um, it's so difficult to start up. You know, first of all, Um, despite the evidence, I mean, we now have really many years of experience with such schools. Sudbury Valley started more than 50 years ago, and it's got hundreds of graduates. And um, now there are some other schools that have been around long enough, and they have many graduates. The graduates are out there doing well in the world. Um, There have been a number of, I've, I've published some studies of how the graduates are doing, and others have too. And, um, and so the evidence is out there that the schools work. And, but even people who see that evidence, um, it's very, uh, it's still the tiny minority of people who um, have ever gone to such a school. And so it's a very unusual thing to do <laughs> to send your child to such a school. <laughs> and, and when you, if you do send your child to such a school, you can anticipate a lot of um, anxiety about it and criticism from other people. I mean, your own parents, your children's grandparents may think you're ruining your children's lives, their their grandchildren's lives. How dare you do that? The neighbors are going to be questioning what you're doing. This is, this just seems like such a strange thing to do. When you do something that's not normal in the sense of most people are not doing this, only a tiny bit of people doing it. It can be perceived as abnormal, something really wrong, right? And none of us wants to appear that way. So even people who intellectually have come to grips, they even believe this would be best for my child, find it very difficult to send their child to such a school. So you can be in a major metropolitan area, whether it's Brussels or whether it's Boston, and there's only a tiny number of people 
who would consider such a school? <laughs> so, so, um, so that's the first problem, getting enough, enough people. And yes. of those people who do consider it and who do send their child, as I said before, some of them don't honestly understand it or they think they understand it. And then once they're into it and they see, oh, you know, here's my child, you know, he's been at this school for quite a number of months. And I don't see any evidence that he's doing any arithmetic <laughs> or, you know, or goodness gracious, he hasn't learned to read yet. Or, you know, and all the other children this age are reading and they're doing this and that. And so they begin to question it. Somehow they had this idea that their child free choosing what he or she wanted to do was going to by choice sit down and do schoolwork similar yeah. to what <laughs> they were doing in school and that rarely happens and when it does happen we're always a little suspicious as to whether somebody's forcing the child to do that from home <laughs> so that's uh so that so then there are a number of people who feel like um like oh this wasn't this really uh, this really wasn't what i expected this isn't working out for my child maybe it would work out for some children but my child is not educating himself at this school in the way that i conceive of as education mm -hmm. you need to uh, you need to have a lot of trust in your child you need to be very patient you need to understand that um that you can there's really except for except for learning your native language without an accent um there's nothing that rec that for which there's a critical period for learning there's nothing that has to be learned early there's nothing that is easier to learn early than later <laughs> you can learn to read at any age you can learn you can learn math at any age in some ways the later you learn it the easier it is so so the so parents need to be understanding and patient they need to understand that you know in, in my studies of the of, of uh, graduates of Sudbury schools and of other people who've taken an unschooling kind of path yeah. uh, everybody learns to read including people who were diagnosed with dyslexia they all learn to read <laughs> mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily learn to read at age five or six or seven or even eight or nine <laughs> Some of them go as late as 10 or 11. I, the, the latest I know, I used to say the latest I knew was 14. I discovered somebody who learned to read at age 18. Wow. <laughs> so this, this was somebody, he, he actually um, went on to major in philosophy in college at age 18. <laughs> but he, <laughs> he actually left his Sudbury school uh, unable to read. He's the only person I've ever come across who actually left unable. He never was interested in reading. He decided he wanted to go to college. And of course, he understood that to go to college, he has to know how to read. So he taught himself to read. <laughs> and, like that. <laughs> and like that, really. I mean, truly. And, um, you know, and now I, I, I know him as an adult. Um, uh, he, he reads uh, pretty thick philosophy books. He's uh, a real intellectual. Um, the interesting thing, if you go to, if you're in a regular school, it's very important that you learn how to read early because if you don't, you're really behind because everything else that you do depends upon reading. And, it, and you also be labeled as with some kind of a disorder, you'll be seen as, as, as having some kind of a problem. And, um, and, and, and so I would say that if your child goes to regular school, it really is important that they learn how to read early. But if your child is at a Sudbury school, there are so many interesting things to do, especially these days that don't require reading, <laughs> that, um, that your child is developing other kinds of abilities. They're developing maybe an amazing memory, amazing pictorial ability, amazing, you know, those parts of the brain that aren't involved in reading um, are being developed and finally but at some point everybody for this guy it wasn't until he wanted to go to college usually it's much earlier than that at some point in our society where reading is clearly important everybody finds oh yeah i really should know how to read now and by that point many of them have just picked up reading without even knowing how they learn but some people haven't and they just decide, okay, it's time for me to learn how to read. And they can learn how to read very, very quickly. Very Oftentimes they'll ask for help. 
uh, from a staff member, but the staff, but it's nothing like the teaching of reading in school. It's sort of, it, it, first of all, by that point, they probably know a little bit more about reading than they think they do. They probably can recognize quite a number of words. They probably have some sense. They certainly know the alphabet. They have some sense of the sounds of letters. But you can show them there's a code here. There are these sounds that are sounded out. and. And, um, and they can learn to read very, very quickly um, when, when they find a need to do so. Reading is something that, I, I guess I'm emphasizing reading because it's something that's scary to parents yes. when their kid can't read yeah. by a certain age. I think a lot of parents don't fret so much about math, which is the other thing that some fret about because most parents recognize that they themselves don't know math and they're getting along okay in life, <laughs> but they can't imagine getting along without knowing how to read, so. <laughs> yeah, it is a point of like, that brings up a lot of, of uh, fears. And it's so wonderful that there is a, a place like a Sudbury school where, where the school holds, like keeps, doesn't do any compromise. If you don't want to do something, uh, no matter right. how long it is respected, and it's for real. And the kid really trusts and realizes this is not fake freedom. And this is, this is, this is for real. And right. that's right. an important uh, support system that the school, uh, to, to, so that the kid develops trust in the, in, in the system too. Yeah. I, I think the other challenge when it, there are some other challenges when a school first starts. So mm -hmm. the, it, the schools, democratic schools operate best after, um, after a few years of operation because the school has to develop kind of a culture. You have to have yes. people who've been there long enough, students who've been there long enough that they kind of know how the school works. They have certain expectations. Sudbury Valley itself, which was the original Sudbury school that the others are kind of modeled after, um, actually closed after its first year. <laughs> I, I don't know if everybody knows this, mm -hmm. but it actually closed after its first year. It opened up with a lot of fanfare. Um, and this was at a time in the 1960s where alternative schooling and so-called free schools were very popular in the United States. A.S. Neal's book, Summerhill, had come out, had been translated into English. And, and there was a lot of interest, in some sense, too much interest. So, so the school started with more students than uh, they had expected. And most of the students were rebellious teenagers. Right. Yes. <laughs> and so here they were coming into a school that had no existing culture and rebellious teenagers who were in some sense hell bent on proving that this school couldn't work. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, were there. You know, and they were lighting fires in the barn. They were they were using drugs. They were doing the kinds of things that would um, get the school shut down by authorities. Um, and they were not taking the school meeting and the judicial committee that enforces the rules seriously. And you didn't have, a, you didn't have there were some students who took it seriously, but you didn't have a sufficient culture of respecting the rules of understanding this. And so here it was, you can imagine how devastating that was to the founders of the school. You know, they had this ideal image of what was going to happen. And here, were, here was this situation. So finally, what they did is they simply said, we're closing the school. We're giving every family their tuition back. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and, then, and then a year later, they opened much more quietly <laughs> with more little kids. <laughs> Not so many teenagers. And over the years, then they gradually expanded. And now in any given year, there might be a certain number of rebellious teenagers who come into the school, but they're entering a school where their own peers, the other teenagers are telling them, you can't do that here. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't use drugs here. You can't do alcohol here. The rules... The, the school would close down. We value this school. If you, and if you did that, the school would close down. So 
the teenagers, there's no, no kind of pressure that's more valuable towards be, doing the right thing than peer pressure to do so. And that happens once you've got enough students there who understand how the school works and who know how the school works. So now students are entering an established culture and they are, and whenever we enter an established culture, we all kind of by nature look around to see what's acceptable here, what's not acceptable here. And in, in a Sudbury school, because of, there are clear rules, it's not, it's not, you know, people think of, oh, it's a free school, anything goes, not true. There are clear rules. There are, rule, there are the kinds of rules that any group of people needs to have to get along with one another. You can't, you can't harass one another. You can't hurt anybody. You can't destroy property. If, and some of the rules are even things like, no matter what your age is, if you take something out, you've got to put it away when you're done. You know, if you're, yeah. even if you're a four-year-old, if you take the toys out, you're expected to put them back. And, and um, you might be called up to the judicial committee if you don't. Some people think that's harsh, but but in fact, the sentences aren't harsh. It's like, okay, if this happens again, you know, maybe you'll have to go for a day without being allowed in the playroom. And even four-year-olds can understand that. So the whole, the whole idea of the school is learning to take responsibility. For, or that's a big part of the school, learning to take responsibility for yourself. And, and so you not only are you taking responsibility for your own education, because nobody's telling you what you have to do for that, but you're also taking responsibility for the community. There are certain rules, you have a voice in making those rules, but you have to follow those rules. And if you can't follow the rules, if you consistently refuse to follow the rules, that's the situation where you will be eventually out of the school. And I also think that's a hard thing for schools, a hard thing, especially for staff members to say this, we think we could really help this child, but this child is consistently breaking rules, mm -hmm. consistently doing it in a way that's disruptive to everybody else. Yeah. For the sake of the school, we have to have a school meeting to decide on whether this student can continue here as a student or not and what are the conditions in which the student continue or not and so among the hardest things that ever happens at a Sudbury school is the occasional first suspension of the school of the student you know you can't come to school unless you are ready to follow the rules and unless you come back and declare and then if they come back and declare and they still don't follow the rules that truly might be the end of their experience at the school so there are some cases where the school doesn't work for a child and that's be, that's where the child for whatever reason either is unable or more often unwilling to follow the rules of the school yeah and it's so important that a school abides to that, so yes. that the culture uh, knows that they're in a they're in a real kind of a, infra of a framework, and that it's not tuitions that are more important than the values uh, to maintain this community. And so the, it's an important point. Yeah, right. um, I have a, a question. I don't know if you're finished on on this, but I have a question also about. When it comes to the members of the personnel, how, how, what have you seen? And also what could be the pointers in maintaining um, a, a balance between, you know, the, the fears maybe coming from the parents and them being able to be fully, uh, you know, focused and just committed to being able to, you know, do their job at the school. Um, how sometimes I, I've noticed it's, it's pretty hard when you're getting a lot of pressure from one side and right. the expectations from the parents, you know, that are, that, uh, that, 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 you know, end up really being imposed on, on the educators. And, and so that really grinds on them and they have to kind of find a way to still keep this framework uh, with the kids. Have you seen incidences of, of, of this phenomenon and how right. to deal with this? Right, I, I think that's um, one of the one of the big biggest problems, and it's often a continuing problem, but it's especially big early on in the school is um, is um, 
parents want to have an influence in how the school operates. Um, so, you know, they're paying the tuition if there's tuition. And so they feel like they should have a voice in how the school operates. If they were paying tuition to send their child to a fancy prep high school, they wouldn't expect that they can go in and tell the tell the principal of the school how the school should operate. But somehow they think at this kind of a school, because it's small, because it's supposedly democratic and so on, they can go in and and um, that they should have a vo they should have a voice. It shouldn't be just the students and the staff members. So I think number one, it's very important to say to parents right from the beginning, this school is administered by the students and the staff members, not by the parents. You have the right to send your child or not send your child, but you yes. do not have a voice in how the school operates. That may be hard for parents to hear, but they have to hear that because if they continue on believing that they can influence the operation of the school, that they, that they then the school will not be able to continue on as a democratic school. It will eventually be compromised in one way or another. Yes. And um, and then it'll become more like just a typical little progressive school or it may yeah. disappear entirely. Yeah. So I, th I think it's very important that a, a newly founded democratic school have a clear what might be called a constitution. This is the statement of principles of this school. This school is there are many ways in which this school will change over time, but these things will not change. <laughs> this is what defines this school. And anybody who, and so one of those things that defines this school is that it's run by the students and the staff and not by the parents. <laughs> and, and that the parent and there and that and that the school has the right because schools can differ on this, but the school has the right to say parents cannot even be in the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's actually very important that schools have such a rule, at least that they can't hang around all day at school. Mm -hmm. Because part of, the, part of the children's education is learning how to deal without their parents, you know, <laughs> with, uh, you know, that's part of uh, the whole purpose of any school in some sense. That's some value in, in sending your child to any school is that the, you're, you're out of, you are learning, you're learning how to deal with the world, including the rough parts of the world, <laughs> right, without your parents there telling you how to deal with it or protecting you and so on and so forth. And, uh, Sudbury School is a pretty safe place to do that because there are these other staff, there are these democratic procedures. So you, because of age mixing, the kids are pretty nice to one another. The older kids look out for the younger kids and so on and so forth. So this is a pretty safe place to do that. But nevertheless, there are parents who really want to be there with their kids or they want to, they, in some sense, sometimes the parents are jealous, you know, the kids have all this <laughs> great opportunity to be at the school. Why can't I, you know, and so, so I think it's really important to keep, you know, that at the same time, you want to be very nice to parents, you want to do everything you can to help explain to parents, I think it's very important to have maybe regular meetings with parents in which parents can air their views in a setting where it's understood this is not part of the democratic process of the school, but we're interested in hearing what you have to say and so on and so forth. And we hope you're interested in what we have to say about how things are going at the school. You don't, it's also hard for parents that they're not getting regular reports about their child. Um, you know, if you're, if you're sending your child to a typical school, you get something called a report card every now and then that tells you how the students are doing. And, um, and you don't get that because part of the, it, part of the part, there are a number of reasons for that, but part of it is, that the trustful relationship between children and staff members depends upon the staff members taking a very non-judgmental approach to the children. Um, and, and the idea that, the, that, the, that the, there's some kind of protection of your privacy while you're at the school. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and although parents might not want to hear this, children need a certain degree of privacy from their parents. 
Yes. There are things you do, there are things you say, there are ways you try out being your kind of person that you don't want your parents to know about. Exactly. You know, there was a time, um, in, and I'm talking about the United States now, uh, a time when I was a kid, and even when my own son was a kid, which was still quite some time ago, uh, when kids could just go out and play with other kids away from parents. Kids spent a lot of time with other kids away from parents. You had a lot of privacy from your parents. Mm -hmm. Today, at least in the United States, that's much harder to do. Yeah. Uh, parents have become so overprotective. The society doesn't allow children in public the way they used to. There's exactly. not as many vacant lots to play in. There's no yeah. other kids out there to play with. So you're more or less in the presence of your parents or other adults all the time. One of the great values of a Sudbury school, of a, of a democratic school, is that there's a lot of other kids and you can get away from the adults, including mm -hmm. the staff members. But even if the staff members over here, you can trust that the staff members are not going to report it to your parents unless unless they have a discussion with you and there's um you know there, there there are situations where staff members do feel compelled to report to parents but that always involves a meeting that involves the students and the parents that would be for example if the child has done something that would warrant a, a suspension from the school, the parents have to know that. The parents have to know what it was, why it was, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But short of that, that uh, you know, I think staff members often will say things optimistically to the parents, which is a good thing. Be, they'll say, you know, oh, you know, your kid is doing fine. We're really, we love your kid here, and so on and so forth. And and. Parents like to hear that, but that's the, that's the same thing you would say if you were an uncle or aunt or, you know, to the child, and, but you're, but not, but not reporting any details, not reporting minor problems that your child is facing at the school, not, not, um, you know, to use the, to use the, the, what might be the appropriate word for it, not tattling on your child yes. <laughs> to the parents, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, that's wonderful. Um, let me see. Um, is there anything else we could tackle about this? This 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 thing about the cult, the development of a, a stable culture is uh, is is incredible. Um, and I feel that it's it's something really important, and that we have to work together to make sure, like that. Um, at least every city has uh, like a democratic school and an opportunity to have such a such a structure in in a city. In Brussels, here we're a, it's a it's a city of 1.2 million, and it, it seems to me impossible to, to 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 conceive that there is not one democratic school in a, in a city like this. And so I feel it is such a, an important job to. You know, just really protect um, and, and support a school like this through that establishment of a of a culture, so that it it becomes uh, it, it it's resilient and can survive those uh, the, the, those first years. Um, and so, I think maybe we've we've covered a little bit the subject of of the difficulties. Yeah, that it that it could. I don't know if you have anything else that you could think of that might be. Oh, there's one, sorry, there's one thing I'd like to maybe just bring up also. Sure. Um, uh, when, a, when a democratic school starts, the staff members uh, might not have any previous experience in, in, this, kind of, uh, in, in this kind of system, and therefore right. they might have doubts themselves. They're not convinced. Um, they have they have never really seen this before they right. and so they also have to work through their own um, doubts and and inner conflicts about that and so that's also a process that takes some time we've seen also at the school that there's a lot of staff that come and go because they're also trying to figure out a little bit how they stand in all this and if if they really believe in this or if it or if it just con conflicts too much with their um with their concept of, of what's possible. And so I don't know if you have anything you'd like to comment about that, if you've seen that and, and how, 
what people in in the school uh, as the staff can focus on more in order to to make this transition more um, stable and smooth or yes i don't know if you have any right to yeah about that. yeah yeah no I, that's a that's a really good point and and um it's always a situation with new staff and again um Again, that's also part of the maturing of a school where the, you've, got a, you've got some staff who've been around long enough that they've learned to trust the process. <laughs> they've yes. learned, yeah. and, those, and those staff who've been around long enough can advise and reassure and help train new staff on, you know, when do you intervene, when do you not? <laughs> Um, yes. I don't want to say there's no case where you would intervene, but where, it, but you wouldn't intervene about an educational thing. That's just part of you. Don't go around saying to, to Johnny because he doesn't read at age ten. Don't you think it's time for you to learn to read? That's simply something that you don't do. That's part of the. That's that's a. That's just that's that. But. On other kinds of things, you know, to what degree? So here's here's something that often comes up. Yeah. And there are schools that differ. And even in my own mind, I go back and forth on this and I can understand both arguments. So there are some staff um, members at such schools um, who believe that that staff members should not ever initiate learning opportunities so they shouldn't bring in so for example you might have some kind of a thing that you think the kids would be really interested in and so you bring it in mm -hmm. <laughs> as a uh, in the hopes that you know this will be something interesting and fun to do i'm not going to make anybody look at this or do anything but i'm bringing it in mm -hmm. so there are some staff members uh who would say no that's that's wrong that because what you're doing is it's really you're it's really the children themselves that should be taking every initiative about what they're doing what they are you know what they're experiencing and if a staff member brings something in especially if it's something that seems to be kind of educational in some sense in some tr traditional sense then some students are going to feel like they have to do this because this is a staff member who's brought this in and so on and so forth. So that's one view of it. Mm -hmm. The other view, especially if it's a small school and where there's not so many students bringing things in and getting things started. The other view is, well, you know, why not? Why not? Why shouldn't I be doing this interesting thing that's interesting to me? And maybe some, maybe some of the other students, some of the students will be interested. Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I suggest a field trip? Why shouldn't I, uh, as a staff member, say, why does, you know, um, as long as students are completely free to, um, to uh, do it or not do it, there's no pressure, uh, e e subtle or unsubtle for doing it. So that's something that staff members, I think, legitimately differ on and different yeah. schools take. In, in, my, yeah. in my experience, the, the sort of um, what I might call the dogmatic approach of staff don't do anything <laughs> that, that would have to do with initiating some kind of activity or learning works best if it's a pretty large school and there are plenty of older kids who are doing that kind of thing you don't right. need staff to do that kind of thing but if you've got a relatively small school and there's not a lot of teenagers who are who are bringing in interesting things or doing interesting things i don't i i think it can be valuable for staff members so this but that's just my opinion and yeah. i know that you know in reading the writing of some of the people who have founded uh sudbury model schools i know that this is something that they debate in their own mind and that staff often continue to debate what should be the limits you know to what degree are we here just to respond to student initiatives and to what degree can we take some initiatives ourselves <laughs> to yes. um, bring things into the school, bring opportunities, including learning opportunities into the school? I, I join you on this one. I have, this is exactly uh, a point of discussion that's been coming up several times uh, throughout the year with, with all the members of the, of the staff. And it's true, we have a really small school 
And so people are a little bit wondering, like, what's the rules here? Like, what, sh what, what's the, what's, what should we be doing? And, right. uh, but I join you on the fact that uh, when it's small, it's, 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 it could be interesting to just introduce things that could spark curiosity. Uh, right. if, you, if, if one respects completely the, the fact that if the kid is curious and wants to take it to a next step, that that really is, belongs to the child and that no, no, pushing or nudging is done and so so yeah i identify really strongly with what you say um, and the fact that if you have so much stimulation and by in a larger in a larger context with, with p kids from every age doing all kinds of activities then it's it's nice to have a step back and and to leave that to to the culture to kind of do their own thing so Sorry. that's that's a really nice point you're touching on because i've i've noticed these conversations um in in, in our school so that's fantastic um great uh, let me see if there's anything else uh, i'd like to wonder about this um one other thing yep. I might point out regarding the role of staff is that yep. as schools get larger, you in some ways need fewer staff <laughs> and uh, certainly fewer per student, you know, because the students are doing much more themselves and are and as you as a school is larger and some of the students have been there for a while and they can take on a lot of the responsibilities of the school that staff might otherwise need to do. And and um, and there are always other students you can go to for help. Um, so the schools become the bigger the school is, the more uh, financially viable it is because you don't need to match the increase in students with increase in staff. Very you can have you know there are some schools, for example, that start off with maybe seven staff members for thirty kids and. Uh, Sudbury Valley at some point had um, on 200 kids and they had eight staff members so yeah. the you can so the you know the ratio doesn't need to be maintained of, stu of students to staff a lot and in, in typical progressive schools where staff play a huge role teachers play a big role in much in in some ways being a teacher is a much more um Labor intensive, intensive, yeah. intensive task because mm -hmm. so much depends upon the teacher who has to know every child and so on. And you kind of need a lot of staff per student, which is why progressive school, Montessori schools and schools of that sort are tip, tend, tend to be very expensive because you need a lot of staff. Mm -hmm. A Sudbury school, once it gets beyond a certain size, can be relatively inexpensive compared to such schools because the, the biggest cost for any school is paying the staff. And of course, that's another thing regarding a school starting is you need to have some kind of a financial plan. How is the school going to support itself, especially through those early years? Yeah, very often you have staff who are volunteers or who are working for very low pay. But uh, as committed as they are, that's not going to continue forever. They're not going to be able to continue working for low pay or for no pay. Um, and you need to be able to pay them a reasonable amount. You need to be able to figure out how to make the school financially viable. Very often people who start such a school are idealistic in many ways and sort of don't believe in money, you know, but you, you've got to be able to figure out how you're going to pay the bills, how you're going to pay the staff. Um, you have to have charge enough for tuition. If you're going to have students who come uh, for reduced tuition or no tuition, you have to be willing to charge a little more for those who can afford it. Um, all of that, all of those things as um, those financial problems are one of the reasons that schools um, don't make it. Yes, good point. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get on to the last question. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Uh, we might be already approaching, uh, but I'll, I'll just go ahead with the last right. question. Um, you've shared this many times before th through um, what you've written and what the talks you do, uh, but maybe you could just mention uh, briefly here why you think that um, democratic education develops 
specific skills in 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 kids that other systems do not allow that's that to be possible that are critical to be able to uh, be able to adapt to the to the world we're coming into and to become uh, to be able to generate creative solutions and also to live a life of meaning as you said at the start of the of the interview right so you know, we live in a world today where um, the kinds of skills and information um, that are taught in school are not really that important, <laughs> as important as they were in the past. Um, we don't need people who've memorized a lot of information. You know, we've got um, we've got these things right here. Anything you want to know, you push a button and you find out. You don't need to hold it in your memory. <laughs> you can use your brains for more interesting things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the uh, we don't need people who can do routine calculations carefully because we've got computers for that. We don't need people who can tolerate uh, long hours of doing boring work <laughs> because we've got we've got robots we've got computers we've got so what is it that we do need we need people who who have what you know what is basically the question is what are the human skills that can't be replaced with robots and computers right yeah, because those exactly. are the jobs that are going to be out there yeah we need first of all we need people who are really good at getting along with other people. Uh, that's a, always going to be an important skill. That's not something that a computer can do. We need people who know how to interact with other people, who know how to, yeah, and, um, and we are social animals. We're always going to be social animals. The workplace is, uh, is in some ways more social than ever. And so at a Sudbury school, children are interacting with one another all the time. There's constant practice in how to get along with diverse other people, including people who are different age from you, of different ideas from you. How do you get along with these people? Uh, you're, so that's, that is one thing. A second thing is um, the, we are, you almost have to be uh, an entrepreneur today. Um, and you can't, you can't depend on um, entering a workplace in a routine job that's going to be the same job for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, you've got to be well, you've got to be able to be creative. You've got to figure out maybe a new way to make a living. You've got to be able to learn on the job. You've got to be creative. You've got to be, you've, you've, and, and that means those are the kinds of skills that children in self-directed education are practicing all the time because nobody's telling them what to do. <laughs> so you've got to figure out what to do. You've got to plan what to do. You've got to, that doesn't mean you can't get help. That doesn't mean you, you don't, you're, that you're an island all by yourself. But you, in the context of something that is much more like the real world than a typical school is, <laughs> you are figuring out every day, what am I going to do this day to make this day interesting? How am yes. I going to get along with this kid who's kind of bothering me? I don't necessarily want to bring him up to the judicial committee, but I want to figure out how I'm getting along with him. You know, you're solving real world problems every day at such a school without somebody looking over you and solving them for you. You are, you're spending a lot of time playing and doing creative things. Um, whereas in schools, you're, you're, you're doing things that are, you're, that are rote and routine. You're being told what to do. You're not exercising that natural creativity that human beings have. And it's creativity that is especially important today because that's what robots and computers can't do. They can't be creative in the way that a human being can be creative. And so we need people who can think outside the box. We need people who can think of questions that haven't been answered and answer those questions. And children, when they're playing, when they're exploring, they're, do, they're practicing this all of the time. They're learning how to take responsibility for themselves because um, they don't have somebody micromanaging them and um, usurping the responsibility for them. Um, it, the, you're, you grew up, one of the things that I observe about 
graduates of, uh, of democratic schools is they don't, um, there's a tendency in our society, in some cases it's understandable, but I think we go too far with it, to blame other people, to blame the world for what's, for our fate, right? Yeah. You know, I had terrible teachers or I, my parents were awful or I grew up in this, that if you grow up in a, in a self-directed environment in a Sudbury school, you learn to take responsibility yourself. It's harder to say it's all the fault of somebody else, <laughs> right? Yes. And I think schools almost train you to believe that it's the fault of somebody else. If you buy into the school message, this basic school message is do what we tell you to do and life will be good for you. Don't do what we tell you to do and life will be bad to you. So you do what they tell you to do and wait a minute, life turns out not to be so good. Oh, it's the fault of that school. But at a Sudbury school, nobody's telling you that. <laughs> you know? Nobody's telling you it's up to you. It's completely up to you. So you, you learn to take and you and, and as part of the social development, you're not only communicating with other kids on a regular basis, but at the school meeting, you're learning how to, and, and in the judicial co committee, where if you've been brought up, accused of something, um, you learn to defend yourself. You learn to present your point of view. You learn to argue your case, if you will. <laughs> and that's a valuable, I mean, certainly for getting a job. One of the reasons I think that uh, students, graduates of democratic schools do so well in getting into competitive colleges if they want to, yes. is that they interview very well. <laughs> they often uh, are interviewed because they don't have the usual um, documents. Yeah. 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 So, so the, uh, so, you know, what the, the college or university if it's a good college or university, they're not just going to throw the application out because this, this looks like somebody who's potentially pretty interesting, right? So how are we going to find out? We better invite them for an interview. And, and the experience is that these young people interview very well. They're not afraid of talking to adults. They're not afraid of looking at adult in the eye. They're not afraid of saying what they really think. And if they've decided to go to college or university, they have a good reason for doing so and they're able to articulate what that is yes. <laughs> and if they're going to college x they've they've done some study and they know this is why i want to go to college and they can tell the admissions officers that uh oftentimes they you know i'll give you one example that one of the graduates of sudbury valley school many years ago went on to major in economics at a rather uh, uh, competitive school. And um, she asked uh, to interview and be interviewed by the chair of the Department of, of uh, Economics as part of her own decision as to whether she wanted to go there or not, but also <laughs> as part of their decision. Well, she was smart enough to read the books uh, by the, written by the chair of the department and to be able to discuss them intelligently with him. Right. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, this, this doesn't happen on a routine basis. And so I'm sure that that professor uh, immediately called the admissions office and said, you know, this girl is brilliant. Whether or not she was brilliant is another question, but she knew enough to know how to really impress somebody in an interview. And I think that, I think that that's not uncommon for graduates of self-directed education. They know how, they, 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 have, they figure out what they want and really need to live the life they wanna live. And then they figure out how to do it and take charge of how to do it. Mm -hmm. And because it's genuine, it's not fake, it's genuine. Uh, she really was interested in economics. She really did find those books interesting. She had heard of that professor. That's why she wanted to go to that college. And so this wasn't fake. And, and I mean, you can't just really fake this and make it impressive. So because it's authentic, because it, and, and then there's a final point that I wanna make that's kind of related to the point that I just made with this story about this young woman. And that's it. My research on people who've been in charge of their own education, whether it's at a democratic school or whether it's in homeschooling by the method called unschooling where children are 
responsible for their own education. Um, what I find is that a very high percentage of them go on to careers that are direct extensions of passionate interests that they developed when they were children. Because they've had so much time to play and explore and they've done different things, a large number of them, not everybody by any means, but I would say about 50%, get passionately interested in some endeavor, and then they figure out a way to make a living doing that. And, um, and you know, so how lucky they are, they're going on in a career, which is for them play, because it is what they really love to do. We live in a world where there are so many different ways of making a living. If you are really motivated to do it, and if you're really good at it, that almost anything that you're interested in, you can make a living doing it. Um, not everybody can, and, it, and there's often a risk and you may fail and it's not gonna always work. But for a very high percentage of graduates of Sudbury education, it does. And so of, or of, of uh, any kind of self-directed education, it does. So there are, you know, I could give many examples, a movie director who loved to make YouTubes as a kid, who a uh, ship captain who loved to play with boats as a kid, um, inventor who loved to tinker and create things as a kid, a mathematician who somehow got fascinated by science fiction and mathematics as a kid, uh, a head of a, a, of a department in uh, the high fashion industry who love to sew doll clothes as a kid, and so on and so forth. There are just numerous examples of that sort where you, you, know, you haven't done the usual track of what you've done in school, but you've done something that actually could lead to a career. <laughs> you, know? uh, you, you, just, you're not, you haven't done it initially because it could lead to a career. You've done it because it's fascinating to you. And lo and behold, um, you then dis you then because you want to continue doing this, um, you go you go on to a job in that uh, a career in that realm. Thank you so much, Peter Gray, for having this moment um, that we could exchange. It is such a privilege, and I come out of this conversation so energized. It's truly a pleasure, and so. Um, I'll leave you today uh, for rest and thanks so much for your time and have a beautiful day. And I will stay in touch with you with whatever I edit or I won't edit, but I mean, if I use sure. a piece, I'll keep, you, um, I'll keep you updated in every step of the way so you can have a say in how I do things. And so you'll be informed every step of the way. No, it's been um, it's been it's been a pleasure. So thank you and good so luck much. with the school. Yes, thank you so <laughs> much. Have a lovely day. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.